Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and Isabella, I'll make you presenter here shortly. I just, I do want to introduce you first. All right. Uh, in keeping with this year's VIDM theme, Birth Equity for All, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Isabella Smart, who will discuss with us Te Wairoa and Mana Kitonga in midwifery. Isabella, who is Scottish by birth, changed her career at 40 and received a degree in midwifery in Nottingham in England. She worked for six years in the community as a midwife in socially deprived areas and with asylum seekers and migrants before relocating to Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2008. There she worked as a clinical midwife specialist in diabetes for seven years before becoming a midwife manager for public health community-based maternity services in South Auckland in 2016. Isabella is committed to tackling health inequities faced by pregnant women, particularly Maori Wahini and women from the Pacific Islands by providing innovative midwifery services. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your experiences, Isabella. And I, I will now turn over the microphone to you. There we go. And there you are. So I'm just waiting for my slides. Oh, do you see the down at the bottom there? Remember the little arrow if you push yep. it forward? Yeah, sorry, I didn't do that for you. There you go, thank you. Okay, thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa. My name is Isabella Smart. I'm a midwife manager, as it's been explained in South Auckland in New Zealand. Um, I want to uh, share with you some of the work that we've been doing in uh, our community midwifery service, which is part of what's called a district health board, so um, attached to a hospital and providing community midwifery. Te Waiora is a term that was gifted to us by uh, one of our Maori social workers, and it's really about um, having a healthy life. And manakitanga is um, te reo Maori for uh, a concept that is translated in our DHB's values as being kind, but it's actually much more than that. It's about understanding women's needs, wrapping care around them and reacting and providing what women need to get the best outcome in pregnancy in this context. In case any of you are um, unfamiliar with where I'm speaking from, this is uh, an interesting infographic that shows um, Aotearoa, uh, which is the Te Reo uh, name for the country, uh, New Zealand. Uh, it shows the two islands uh, superimposed across Europe. To give you an idea of the the geographical size of New Zealand and the population is just under 5 million. So we have uh, limited and uh, varied um, maternity health resources, but we do have a system where the uh, health authorities and the Ministry of Health fund uh, self-employed midwives. So the majority of care is provided to women by self-employed midwives who claim money from the Ministry of Health for the care of women and women can choose the midwife that cares for them. The work that I do in South Auckland is providing uh, care for women through employed midwives and uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a bit about those women as we go on. Further information for um, all of you that may be unfamiliar, um, New Zealand is uh, by constitution a bicultural nation and in 1840 the Treaty of Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed by Maori signatories, uh, not every um, iwi that's uh, equivalent of a large tribal um, conglomeration uh, signed this with the British Crown but the idea was from the understanding of the Treaty of Waitangi that um, it would be uh, Maori would not cede their sovereignty and that there would be protection, uh, partnership and participation. Obviously colonisation followed 
which um, meant that these uh, principles were not fully realized in any way, shape or form. So as a consequence, the, uh, the impact of colonization on the indigenous population is similar to the, the same experience throughout the world. So I, I don't really need to go into that in any great depth. I'm sure you'll all be able to have familiarity in your own countries or from knowledge of other countries about uh, the impact of colonization on health, on maternal health and uh, ongoing intergenerational effects of that situation. Now, so that you uh, get a little bit of background from um, my perspective and the perspective of Midwifery New Zealand, we're about promoting well-being. We're about trying um, to enable the best outcome for women from a physiological process of being pregnant and uh, birthing your baby. These are some of the influences, which is always traditional in any uh, presentation to uh, talk about your sponsors and influences and all the rest of it at the beginning. So the College of Midwives, uh, my health board, Counties Manukau Health uh, that employs me, the Midwifery Council here and uh, the Ministry of Health, also the International Confederation of Midwives. And that's just a selection of, of views of the types of facilities we have and the women we care for here in Aotearoa. Now, interestingly enough, um, in terms of striving towards equity, uh, because there's great health inequity at the moment, um, the Midwifery Council and the uh, College of Midwives in New Zealand uh, have our standards both in English and also very specific standards in Te Reo Māori. So the Tūranga Kaupapa, these are um, standards which uh, clearly outline and inform midwifery practice in relation to the rights, needs, wishes uh, under the treaty uh, for Māori wahine. And wahine is the Te Reo Māori word for women. I'm very happy for all of these slides to be provided afterwards because it's always uh, tempting to put a lot of information on the slides, uh, but you don't have time to talk about it all. But yeah, I'm very welcome for everyone to have this information afterwards, particularly if you can't see some of the, the very small um, uh, print that's there on the screen. Uh, this is uh, to give you an idea of uh, the context for midwifery in South Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, this is from the latest uh, quality and safety health report by our local health board uh, for our area. And on the, the right hand side of the screen, as you look, you'll see a 36%. And that really is um, in our area, the geographical area that we provide midwifery care, 36% of women live in um, high socioeconomic deprivation. So that's almost one in two children in South Auckland are living in poverty and they're living in sometimes relative but absolute poverty. Um, and we are twice as many as, as the next highest uh, health board in New Zealand. So it's a particularly economically deprived area. And if you look at the, the um, to the right of the 36, there are some bar graphs and it explains that Maori, Pacific women and Indian populations are overrepresented in the most socioeconomic deprived areas. And these are areas that we cover here in South Auckland with our midwifery service. Our population in the area is roughly 16% Maori, although I'll show you in the next slide, we birth more percentage of, of women than that, than higher than that. Sorry, I think I've gone, I've gone one, two forward, <laughs> excuse me. This slide here. Uh, what makes our women unique? And it means that we need to look at how we deliver services and make them relevant, is that um, we have uh, about 20% of our birthing population are Maori women. 34% uh, are women from the Pacific Islands. 
And about 16, 17% are in women of Indian descent. So that might be Fijian Indian, or as we say, Indian Indian, because that's what the women tell us uh, to help us understand that they've migrated from the subcontinent. Uh, although 20% on this graph here uh, says European and other in the birthing population, actually in South Auckland, in the care that we give, and the two and a half thousand women that we care for a year, we have very, very few European women. It's in single digits. Uh, most of our population that we care for is overwhelmingly Pacifica, um, Maori and Indian. About 25% of our population, birthing population is Indian, probably over over 60%, around about 50, 60% would be Pacifica, and around over 30% Māori women. Now, one of the things that um, I wanted to share with you today and in the um, outline that I sent in for the presentation was family violence. Uh, the background to this is in 2017 or 18, uh, between those dates, the New Zealand police looked at their response to family violence. So that's some people would refer to that as intimate partner violence, but we use a wider terminology of family violence because it might not be violence from an intimate partner, but it might be within the family unit. And the police looked at how they were dealing with this because statistics weren't changing over time and their reactions were uh, typical reactions of calling it a domestic, dividing women up, uh, pulling out the perpetrator, helping, usually it's male, um, helping him to calm down, I don't know, sometimes arresting him, sometimes leaving him in the street and then um, walking away. That's a, a very wide and um, uh, generalised sort of overview, but those kinds of reactions where it's a domestic problem between a couple or uh, people in a family and uh, there's no reason, if there's no crime committed, there's no reason for the police to get involved. So they looked really seriously at how they were dealing with family violence and as I say in 2017 or 18, they came up with a completely different approach. They changed their terminology in how they dealt with family violence, they changed the code name uh, that they use when radioing in, so it's no longer domestic. They then trained their uh, police officers uh, to do an overall view and assessment and to write a report after each call out to a family violence incident. Then they set up what were called uh, safety assessment meetings and they involved health authority and other organisations in looking at each uh, family violence incident and looking at what could be done to offer help, support and to ensure safety of the victim uh, involved in the incident. And because of that, in 2018, they approached the District Health Board and said, we realised that quite a few of the women that we're, we're, we're doing reports on for family violence incidents are pregnant and we'd like to let their midwives know that something's happened uh, so that they're aware that women may be at risk and uh, may need some other help and assistance. And the NGOs, so there are a variety of uh, culturally uh, specific NGOs who work alongside the police to give help and support. Um, they would like to get in touch with the midwives and try and work together uh, to help women in these very complex situations they can find themselves in. So at that point, I then took responsibility for working out how, with the self-employed midwives and the employed midwives, we would uh, find a way that uh, was uh, uh, was following our privacy laws and disclosure laws to be able to uh, share this information and to update midwives who might not be aware that an incident occurred because of lots of reasons of women not sharing it through fear or shame or, or other reasons. So I didn't really know how many were going to be involved and how much work was going to be involved at that time, but that's why I say it's about brave odd and brave collaborations. At some stage, if you're interested in trying to address equity issues, you have to be brave. You have to say, yes, I can do that, even if you've got no idea how you're going to do it and what it's going to lead to, I believe, and you can start exploring it. So this was almost like action research. I said, yes, start, start sending the referrals to us and we'll find a process for notifying people and, and dealing with the outcomes of it. 
So we started on, on this graph, uh, the very uh, left-hand side, as you look at the screen, is 2018. And we had about nine or 10 in the first month. And we thought, oh, that's, that's not bad. We, we, we can kind of manage this. And as you can see, what has happened between now and the end of that graph is 2020, is that we the numbers are just exponentially grown as the police have sent us referrals. And we've been willing to take referrals for women who disclose to the police at an incident that they are pregnant, but they, they haven't got any, mid we can't find any midwifery care logged for them. We then go out and look for those women. We contact them and we offer them midwifery care. So numbers, this is easier for you to see, uh, numbers um, per year started off with our first um, first cohort when we started in July to September 2018 was you know, about, about 11 or 12. And then there was a bit more over the Christmas period. And then from 2019, the numbers have just grown. They've grown. And particularly in 2020, highlighted in red, is April to June. That was the time of our lockdown in New Zealand because of our COVID response. And we had a number of different levels of lockdown and the, we knew in advance that it was likely to be triggers for uh, family violence, people stuck in the houses, unable to get out and use the usual safety methods for getting themselves away from their partners, people unable to work, people affected by uh, intake of alcohol. There was huge amounts of alcohol bought prior to lockdown in New Zealand. and. Um, that really demonstrated that you can you can make good guesstimates based on previous information and other research to uh, enable you to have a response that's positive. So we changed our response slightly then and made sure that we up, updated all of the women's electronic record with uh, information, uh, whether they had an, an employed midwife or a self-employed midwife uh, during COVID. And we've carried on doing that um, now to help communication. Those numbers are also going up um, endlessly and we're um, targeted to reach over over four between four and five hundred referrals a year and remember we care for only about two two thousand two and a half thousand women a year so it's a large proportion of police incidents where the where they are called. So just to give you an idea of who we are and um, and how we deliver our services uh, Corero is a discussion. Uh, so community midwifery, there's around about 60 staff in total. Uh, we have geographical teams. We offer a service uh, all day, uh, every, every day of the year. And uh, we offer antenatal and postnatal care. We offer some intrapartum support in uh, certain circumstances, but that's not what we are funded to provide uh, as community midwives. We've got a variety of team leaders that help to support um, our midwives that are operationally working and they tend to take more complex work. Uh, we have specialty teams uh, who offer their midwives with postgraduate qualifications in diabetes or maternal fetal medicine. We provide a service to the women's prison which is located in Mangere in South Auckland and we also provide the um, midwifery service to the refugee resettlement centre that's also based in our area called Mangere. We have three social workers and we have community health workers and they're really vital for the work that we do uh, in making our work, uh, in helping midwives to be able to do midwifery and not feel that they're, they're trying to work as, as unqualified and best of intention social workers and distracting them and taking them away from providing midwifery care. But it's impossible to be able to provide midwifery care when there are other priorities in a woman's life that need to dressed like she's living in a car or sleeping in someone's floor or she has no food. We have lactation consultants and I also manage a breastfeeding and nutritional support service with what we call kaitipuora workers. So they're support workers who help women uh, with information antenatally on breastfeeding and provide practical support postnatally as well as running classes on healthy cooking and um, infant nutrition. We also have a maternity assessment clinic that runs uh, five days a week and that looks after women who have complexities and they see a doctor and they get a joined up plan that we put on their electronic record. The DHB uh, that I'm employed by has certain values and um, we really try and use those values in our daily work. They're both uh, English and uh, Te Reo Māori uh, in uh, description. 
And the one that we have, I'm focusing on today with the work we do is the Manaki Tanga, which translates as kind, but as I explained earlier on, is a much more complex uh, concept in Te Reo Māori. This is an article, and I know you can't, you won't be able to see this clearly, uh, but uh, this is an article uh, by Pauline Dawson and others about the barriers to equitable uh, maternal health here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And uh, one of the key things that it stresses is that we know there are barriers, there are societal barriers, is the effect of colonisation, poverty, uh, dislocation, relocation, migration, all kinds of things that can impact on uh, inequity in maternity services. But she clearly says that initiatives that appear to be working are adapted to the local context and involve self-determination in research, clinical outreach and community programmes. Um, and I use that uh, as my research base really to justify the fact that we can work with a national program, we can work with um, our standard traditional ways of delivering midwifery care, or we can look at new ways of working that are very specific to our particular needs, may or may not be transferable, elements of them might be transferable, but we need to be proactive in really looking and self-examining ourselves, our biases, our assumptions, and to listen to women and to be flexible enough to change our services to meet their needs wherever possible. So in relation to the work that we do with women affected by family violence and other social economic deprivation, we uh, developed the Te Waiora model. And that's the model that involves all of the support workers I've already talked about. And we think it's culturally congruent. These are our community uh, health workers uh, who do a lot of work with us. So they engage the women in the first instance, talking to them on the phone, explaining what our services are, finding out what the preferences are. And uh, previously we were just getting paper referrals, allocated to midwife, uh, appointments sent out and expecting them to turn up at, at clinics because that's how we would traditionally have run the service. So we find that using the concept, the Maori Te Reo Māori concept of whakawhanaungatanga, which is about getting to know people, really understanding them and their worldview, uh, helps us to engage women in a service that they would perhaps not see themselves represented in or feel that it was relevant to their needs at that time. So for women who are really have really complex health and social needs, uh, we use the Ministry of Health model of multi-agency group support plan and the idea is that we talk with the woman she consents to our involvement more than just a midwife doing midwifery care and we led by the midwife and the community social workers and community health workers we listen to the women we talk to the women about what their needs are it might be housing it might be food it might be an alcohol and drug issue it could be anything really and we work alongside the woman uh, she doesn't often, we don't hold big meetings, we tend to contact individual agencies and get commitment. And you can see here, we, we involve anybody that we need to involve. So for example, we might have on a referral, a uh, woman has, uh, um, in, may have or appears to have an intellectual disability. And then we go and we look to see, well, where is it? What kind? What is it? How can we work with her? How does she need us to provide our service? And for example, one woman in particular, that was not, uh, it hadn't been diagnosed. It was just people's opinion that had become fact and notes. So we got uh, uh, assessments for the woman. We pressured agencies to provide assessments and the cost of assessments, found out how we needed to present information to her. And she was perfectly able to, uh, with support, look after her baby and uh, have a, a, a good outcome. The same with drug services. Drug and alcohol services here um, are very, uh, re uh, residential services very expensive. So sometimes it takes us to put pressure on other agencies rather than to say, oh, the baby should be taken away and looked after by family because the woman has a drug problem. For us to say, no, the mother and baby have a hum basic human rights to be together. And uh, we, the mother wants help. So we would like her to have the opportunity to be placed somewhere along with her baby so that the best outcome for both. So those are the kind of, of that's the kind of work that we do really.
Hey, Isabella, just letting you know, we just have yeah. a few minutes. So um, just so that yeah. we can some no problem. questions. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Sure. So we, um, as you can see here, we do, we have plans that are highly developed with key people that um, are responsible and we enable everyone to do what's required of them. Because often when you're disadvantaged and powerless, uh, you might know that you're entitled to housing, but you might not be able to get it yourself. We use their support systems. We look at the women's worldview and we try to coordinate and enable things to happen for the women. We use models that are culturally consonant, so these are two Te Reo Māori models of health, so that we're not using European and inappropriate uh, health belief systems and models to come up with plans that essentially will fail, and then the women will be blamed for them failing. We really want, uh, in a, the midwife's role is support, advocacy and enabling. I'm going through these quickly now, but the concepts are the same. It's really important. Advocacy is a huge part of the international midwife role for women, being proactive and helping the women to make the right decisions for her. And that's that's the hardest part for us and the hardest part for women, because often their voice is not heard and the midwife is vital for their voice being heard. We have to be brave, the last phrase there, to stand up and walk alongside the woman and her whanau and using our professional privilege to bring about change. We have a tremendous amount of power and it's using it in the most appropriate way to support women to get the best outcomes. And just finish with what we've achieved, really. We've, we've reduced our child protection referrals, women being stereotyped and uh, women uh, that the assumption would that their babies would need to be removed and placed elsewhere. We've been able to enable women to achieve their outcomes, to feel supported, to access services that have meant that better outcomes have been achieved for all. Our midwives have been better educated in understanding the difference between need and risk and therefore not having defensive practice but having enabled strengths-based practice. So we're always trying to work in a humane and culturally consonant way with women so that staff, midwives, community health workers, social workers, everyone involved in them feel confident to help women to get the best outcomes from their pregnancy. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, thanks, Hero. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Thank you. All right. All right, so I'll turn off the record. Um, actually, let's ask a few questions first. Anybody have any questions? You're welcome to put them in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand, I will keep an eye out for that with those icons as well. Uh, what, uh, what an amazing discussion and what achievements you guys have made for sure have you um let's see i noticed a couple of comments one was they've never seen the map that map that's a great map of new zealand posed on the eu that gives us a good idea of the uh, area that we're looking at let's see things are coming in just giving let's give folks a little bit more I have a question for you, Isabella. Um, is there an active campaign to recruit and train more Maori midwives for that culturally congruent care? And what has been the response around that? Yes, um, we have um, Maori midwives, Pacifica midwives working in our service and also throughout the DHB. There's been a recognition that they're underrepresented. So um, starting a few years ago, they moved, uh, they created a second training campus. It was generally on the North Shore, which is a really sort of equivalent of an hour and a half drive um, out of the area to train. So they've opened a campus in South Auckland and have been inundated with um, local women, local women who want to train as midwives. And I heard, uh, I was at a conference yesterday to celebrate International Day of the Midwife a bit early. And um, they have, I think, uh, I think the, the lecturer said 70 
Maori students on their intake for midwifery training across the university at different stages of training. The same with the working in Pacifica and there's been a recent agreement that the Ministry of Health is going to fund specific help and support for Maori and Pacifica uh, students to get into um, university to be financially supported because often they're from the most deprived areas and also to get cultural support because it can be very difficult um, to uh, train in an area where you may already be facing um, uh, systemic and institutional racism and bias and mm -hmm. unconscious bias. So there's been a lot of work in that area and it's a really, it's looking really positive, really positive. Beautiful. Beautiful. It looks like Tammy Heap from New Zealand mentioned that Maori Midwives uh, is doing an invitation for support for a Maori uh, I, I, my apologies for my pronunciation, uh, Maori Bachelor of Midwifery program. Are you familiar with that? Yes, there were um, discussions yeah, yesterday at our um, celebration of midwifery. I've got to show you my, my T-shirt. Apparently the chief midwife here said I have to show you my T-shirt. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, they've. I think they, uh, certainly Nam Namaya and um, the Pacific uh, Midwives Association, I think, are all involved in uh, getting everyone together and defining what the support should be. So it's not coming in from outside from people like me that are full of good intentions. It's actually coming from the people that it matters to that uh, are involved in it to define what the support network should be and what it should look like to enable success and um, hopefully uh, dozens and dozens of Maori and Pacifica and Indian midwives coming into our services uh, to meet the needs of women. Beautiful.